up to things like Wingmate Rock. Uh, Wingmate Rock is one of his more powerful cards in the matchup. It's something that can warrant a sweeper all on its own. But Jason, I believe, only with the two, two, excuse me, two copies in his main deck, a critical card for him. If the game goes late, it's really his only way to keep up with what, Jason, what Jacob's doing later on. Players trading tap lands at the beginning of the game for Jacob. Scry, you see one of his copies of Sidisi, Undead Vizier, certainly the all-star for Reed Duke in our other semifinal. Jacob also playing two copies, playing four Seder Wayfinders, really just to enable that strategy. It's a little bit less reliable than it is in Reed's deck, because Reed has a lot of expendable creatures, but it's still quite powerful. And it, you don't necessarily have to exploit for it to be a good deal. I, against a deck like Jason's, in fact, just casting Sidisi is pretty powerful. Pair of tap lands just for Jason. No, no, none of his turn two threats of Fleece Main Line or Rakshasa Death Dealer. Actually looks like it will be Jacob making the first play here on turn three. And not a good start for Jason. This does happen to Ops on Aggro on occasion. There's a lot of comes into play tap lands. Issues with the color of mana, but in this matchup, it's really important for Jason to have something to do on the second turn. And Corsair of Krufix is the play for Jason, or Jacob rather. And when you look at it, there are a lot of similar cards in the decks, but obviously both of them Siege Rhino decks as their Obs on. Jacob playing three drops like Course of Crufix, whereas for Jason, he has cards such as Anafenza. We'll see if he can get a threat, though, to punch through this 2-4. And maybe not a threat, but he will have a Thought Seize. And Jacob's hand ready to play here. Seder Wayfinder, Obs on Charm, Utter End, and a copy of Sidisi, as well as a fourth land. It's hard to take just one card from this. And this is a summary of why the matchup is good for Jacob. He's got the same power level in terms of threats, but just more robust removal spells. And with Jason not having any sort of early play, the game's going to start coming into, you know, turns four, turns five, turns six, where Jacob has a pretty substantial advantage. Yeah, both Utter End and Obs on Charm should be able to kill nearly any creature in Jason's deck. That said, Sidisi is almost guaranteed to be a two-for-one against this strategy. Especially with the Cedar Wayfinder in, in hand, and one more coming as the draw step next turn. Let's see, he does end up just taking the guaranteed two-for-one. If he's going to slog through it, he'll try to... He'll have to do just that. Takes the copy of Sidisi and now does have his two drop. It's going to be Rakshasa Death Dealer. But even then, if he knows about this Obzon Charm and Utter End in Jacob's hand, this Death Dealer becomes a very weak card in the face of Corsair of Krufix. And Jacob also has a lot of chump blocking to do as well if he wants to with the Wayfinder. So uh, Jacob has a lot of control over how effective this Death Dealer gets to be. Yeah. Jason not, not really able to go for the pump if Jacob just says, OK, I block. Neither, neither Obs on Charm nor Utter End care too much about regeneration. And that's part of the problem with the matchup, too, from Jason's side. Uh, sometimes the way to beat a deck like Obs on Control is to just have this wide array of threats and hope that some of the removal doesn't line up the right way against your threats. Jason doesn't really present that sort of thing. Jacob does have copies of Ultimate Price that don't have a ton of targets. But other than that, most of Jacob's removal spells work against most of the threats that Jason brings to the table. Look at Jacob's hand. Draw, draw was the Seder Wayfinder, so now we know it is two Seder Wayfinders, Obs on Charm, and a fourth land. Has to decide whether or not he wanted to hold up that Obs on Charm as a kill spell. Instead, he will draw two with it, drawing Hero's Downfall and Elspeth Sun's Champion, showing another Hero's Downfall on top of his deck. I think the issue on that turn was that Jacob wanted to cast the Wayfinder to get another shot with the Corsair and to just kind of get that card out of his hand. But the hero's downfall on top of his deck was so attractive that he didn't want to mill that over. So he needed to find a line of play that allowed him to draw the downfall that he wanted and still get another crack at finding a free land with Corsair, and that was drawing two cards with Obzon Charm. And that's what he does. Another downfall waiting, too, so he'll have a, a real plethora of removal. Does mean that he'll take some hits this turn, though. See how much damage Jason can push in. Jacob out with Elspeth in hand, so uh, that's a really problematic card for Jason in the matchup. He can muck it up a little bit with his copies of Bioblight. He can maybe fly over the top. Siege Rhino does a little bit, but that card's very challenging for him to beat and warrants a hero's downfall very quickly in most positions. Yeah, Jason, three copies of hero's downfall, and as far as the air, it is two copies of Wingmate Rock, and that's it. Elspeth Resolved can just close out the game against him. With so many of his creatures at power four or greater, even just Elspeth minus three can take care of most, if not all, of Jason's board. 
And as part of the reason that Jacob's gotten a nice little path so far here, a solid matchup here and beating Ross 3-0 in the quarterfinals is two matchups where Elspeth Sun's champion is at its best. And this is going to be Dramoka's command from Jason. He'll go ahead and give it 1-1 one, one, give it one, one and have Jacob sacrifice an enchantment. So swings in for three. So this allows him to hold up regeneration against the hero's downfall he knows he's playing against. There is Jacob drawing another hero's downfall. We know there's no fourth land. Jacob's hand, downfall, downfall, wayfinder, wayfinder, utter end, and Elspeth's son's champion. So right now, Jacob uh, obviously just on the hunt for land drops here. And with Jason having access to regeneration mana, it seems like a pretty good spot to start to take some of these wayfinders and make his land drops. Because if he gets to Elspeth, uh, it would take a lot from Jason to overpower that. Wingmate Rock is his big way to, to push through it. So we'll see the first Seder Wayfinder from Jacob showing Abzan Charm, Thought Seize, Bio Blight, and in the last card he does get his land. It's a Temple of Malady. And since he didn't find the untapped land, the only other place to make the other Wayfinder. And he'll go ahead and do that. Thought Seize, Courser, finds the untapped one this time in Plains and mills off a Siege Rhino. So pretty big victory there for Jacob. A Scry land this turn, an untapped land for next turn. He can get to Elspeth if he wants it. Two one ones in play. He'll pass back, leaving a card on top with the Temple. So now he has that payoff in Elspeth, and then he has three nearly unconditional kill spells. This will take a lot of work for Jason to stick something. Not to mention Elspeth is, in a lot of ways, just a fourth kill spell. Yeah. <laughs> if Jason, say, taps out for a threat here, Elspeth can just come down and kill the Death Dealer. Here swings the 4-4. Will Jacob chump this turn? Seems reasonable. He'll put it. Debating if he wants to put a 1-1 in front. He has actually a, a good amount of life points to work with. 15. Well, an argument for chump blocking here is, is uh, you know, at any point, this is likely to save the same amount of damage. You're not costing Jason mana, so it's not like ti about timing it about that. And you kind of want to get one of those chump blockers out of the way because Jason's deck plays with bioplate. So on the balance, you're better off just chump blocking early if it's going to save the same amount of damage at any point. And after that attack, there are no plays from Jason. So we'll go over to Jacob. He'll make that sixth land in Elspeth, making three tokens. Now, I do think Jason's at the ready with Hero's Downfalls. So it'll just be the one ones. Even still, that gives Jacob quite a, quite a bit of cushion to work with here. It looks like actually Jason's going to start with Obzon Charm here. He'll draw two, go down to 13. If he has nothing to do with his mana next turn, then you might as well charm now and go ahead and downfall next turn. It does get a little bit awkward if Jason draws something very impactful this coming turn because he probably wants to hero's downfall this Elspeth straight away. Yeah, so he'll untap. So yeah, he definitely will not want Jacob to get another turn with Elspeth. See if he has the removal. A lot of cards now as he'll get his untap. And he'll start with Thought Seize. And there we see the hand that we knew about. This is Hero's Downfall, Hero's Downfall, Utter End. I believe what is a copy, another copy of Sidisi. Yes, that's the second copy. And with all these 1-1s one lying around, I think once again, Thoughtseize just has to take this 4-6. Now, it does leave Jacob with Utter End against Rakshasa Death Dealer, which is nice, but I don't think Jason can just let him have Sidisi in this spot. Yeah, I think ideally Jason wanted to take the Utter End, but Sidisi a much more attractive option. Yep. And he'll go ahead and swing with the Death Dealer. He'll be a chump from Jason. One token jumps in the way. And that attack there, we'll see if he gets, Jacob gets to keep the Elspeth. Here's three lands from Jason. Is this the hero's downfall that he needs? It is. Elspeth will hit the graveyard. And another land from Jason. So he set up not a terrible situation. He has to work his way through a lot of very good removal from Jacob, but the combination of downfall and thoughts, he's has actually taken away all of Jacob's finishers. Well, now this is the, the bigger issue is Jacob has three removal spells in his hand, is knocking Jason down to eight, and spot removal doesn't help Jason a lot here unless it's Bioblade. So Jacob just flipping around, turning this into a damage race, Utter End taking care of the Death Dealer. Now two heroes downfalls as backup. And can Jason stick a blocker? He'd love to see something like Siege Rhino at the very least, something that is resistant to removal. But absolutely right. These heroes downfalls can clear the way for the 1-1s very well. 
And because the tools in these decks are so similar, it's not like Jacob has to sit on his heels the entire game and play defense. He's going to be able to go on the offense as well once he has the board stabilized on the other side. So it is not a pure control versus pure aggro kind of matchup because so many of the tools are overlapping. And now there are weapons that Jason has available. If he draws a card like another Death Dealer or a Fleece Main Lion, he can put a pinch on Jacob's removal. So we see here he's going to go ahead and make Tassiger delving away nearly all of his graveyard and a copy of Wingmate Rock. So by not leaving... Uh, they're not leaving up Tasker mana. No, this is just, he's just trading these with the hero's downfalls. Yeah, I, I think in this spot, I would have preferred for Jason to just go ahead and play Tasker and activate it, unless he's setting up something big. Maybe Soren is powerful enough in this spot where it's worth just trading your resources there for the two downfalls, though now Siege Rhino's going to make that a lot more complicated. Yeah, talking about making a play that's big there, not only does he have the second hero's downfall, but here's Siege Rhino from Jacob. That puts Jason down to two, four attackers in play for Jacob. Jason doesn't play anything like End Hostilities, and we may be on to game two. I assumed that Jacob's line of play here. Uh, the one card I could think of to warn it was Soren. I'm not sure if he has it, but in any event, I don't think Soren would be able to get it done here. And, and Fleece Main Lion certainly won't. Fleece Main Lion, here comes an uh, onslaught of attackers, and that will be game one for Jacob Wilson. Short affair there. We kind of just see the difference in the decks. A lot of the same threats, but those high-end cards from Jason are just not easily answered by J Jason. Yeah, J Jacob's power cards, uh, I mean, Jason had a downfall for the Elspeth, and the tokens were still left over at the end of the game to attacking for lethal. All right, well, that was our one pre-board game. Figured that Wilson would be advantaged in it. See how, though, things can change post-board. Let's start with Jason's side. He got one for one removal was very good against him, and I have to assume he'll add some resiliency. Yeah, I, I like cards like Whisperwood Elemental and Mastery of the Unseen. Mastery of the Unseen is pretty challenging for Jacob to remove, and if the game's settling in, Mastery can do a lot of damage. Now, we saw there Jacob's able to flip pretty fast and go on the offensive. He's got Elspeth and Siege Rhino to that end. But I still think those elements are going to be pretty good here. The two copies of Glare of Heresy are excellent. Gives him an answer to Siege Rhino and Elspeth. And Elspeth of his own, two copies of Valorous Dance, Murderous Cut, Dromoka's Command. These are all pretty good options. Now, on Jacob's side, he has two Fleece main lines of his own. A card like Fire Emblem Plague, Back to Nature, Bioblight, Ultimate Price, Nissa World Waker, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, two Drown and Sorrows, two Duress, an End Hostility, and two Read the Bones. So do we see Jacob just getting becoming even more of a control deck here? Well, I really like the copy of End Hostilities. I think the two Fleece Main Lions help block early, and they pair very nicely with, with End Hostilities as well. The removal spells here, Ultimate Price doesn't have a lot of targets in Jason's deck. I think Bioblight's very solid here. Probably not a Drown and Sorrow matchup. Jason is bringing mostly 3-3s three and 4-4s four and so on to the table. The one Ugin may come in here. I'm not sure if on the balance is better than the, the Garrick that J Jacob has in his main deck. Uh, Ugin is very challenging for Jason to beat, but 8 mana is still 8 mana. Yeah, I'm wondering, so you see like things like an Ugin to read the bones. If he really wants to become a heavy control deck, he can do that. But then again, uh, just cards like Elspeth, are really all he needs to close out games. I think a card like Read the Bones, Jacob is starting to incur some pretty serious risks where Jason has one of his good starts, Jacob stumbling a little bit, and then cards like Read the Bones and Abzan Charm glut up his hand a little bit. And I think that Jacob has such a naturally good end game in this matchup that he doesn't need to take that kind of risk. He can leave something like Read the Bones on the sideline. He still wants his control cards like End Hostilities and, and maybe the Ugin as well, the removal spells that work all the time like Bio Blight. But I don't, need, he, I don't think he needs to go to anything as, as extreme as Read the Bones. Yeah, certainly in the games he's behind, you see that Read the Bones really won't help him solve that. Yeah, I think in matchups like this, it's important to think from Jacob's perspective, what, what are the scenarios where I'm likely to be losing? What does the game look like in the games where I'm losing? What's probably going on is Jason has a good beatdown start. Maybe some of your lands are coming into play tapped or, you know, you, you miss a, one of your three-mana removal spells. And then how good is Read the Bones in those sort of games? It, I would say on the balance, it's pretty poor. And so Jacob will likely not board it in. Now, while these two players get ready for game two, we're going to take a second to review one of the announcements that we made this weekend. And this has to do with the Star City Games buy list. Ben Blyweiss wrote an article on the select side of Star City Games. Now, you know that Star City has had a buy list for quite a while, but we have decided to up that a bit. We now have a new buy list feature on the site, making selling your cards easier. 
than ever. We have a great a new interface, and you can use this to search for the exact card you want to sell with pictures of each card. All you have to do is type it in. It'll automatically create a sell request for you. No longer have to deal with any sort of email. So those prices will change based on conditions, based on language, and even at a glance, it'll total up and know just how much you're getting for your cards. Now. How do you collect that on that? We have uh, different options available for mail and delivery. You can get it at the Game Center in Roanoke, at an open series, or drop off. You can get your buy list pre-approved and avoid spending all that time at the booth. So in between uh, going back to the hotel room and putting on a cup of coffee and, and dancing around to tumbling dice, I went to the website and kicked the tires on the buy list, and it is much, much better. Uh, I will say, I hope that I'm not hurting anyone's feelings here when I say that the previous buy list was probably the worst element of the website. It was pretty hard to navigate, a lot of searching. This one's very smooth to use. So if you have sold cards in, this to the pa in the past, it'll improve your experience. And you haven't, I suggest checking it out because it's much better than the interface we were using before. I mean, I have to say, the, the ability of rather than sitting there at the dealer booth as, he, as you go through cards for an hour to simply, when I've sold cards before, I've already typed them up. They already have my collection there to just submit that and then bring a box and say, here's what I submitted. That's pretty attractive. Yeah, it's, it's just a lot easier. So uh, I decided to try it out for myself. Uh, just to see what it looked like. So, you know, help me describe things in the promotion a little bit better. It is much better. So I would head over to starcitygames.com slash buy list. Check it out now if you haven't already. All right, well, back into the match. We are getting ready for game two. Jacob Wilson taking game one. It's a tough matchup for Jason Coleman. And for Jacob Wilson, he has really taken on all competitors so far. A 3-0 victory over Ross Miriam. Will he be able to sweep through this one? And it's funny, too, Jacob was telling me he went back to the hotel room yesterday to test the matchup against Ross, was on the draw in testing, 10 games, went 0-10, <laughs> went, <laughs> went to sleep, and then woke up and told his friends, I feel good about the matchup, having gotten 0 10 and then played out a little bit differently on camera here against Ross. That is... I don't know if I can ever say I've felt that way after going 0-10 against a deck. Oh, I've, I've played some decks that go 0-10, and it would be 0 and 100. So <laughs> I know the feeling here. I, I, for that kind of matchup, those decks are, are close enough together in the way that they interact that 0-10 sounds like there had to be a lot of variance at play. And Jacob was on the draw for all 10 of those games, but still felt pretty good about his chances, even though he got beat up a little bit in testing back at the hotel room. Well, Jacob is going to be on the draw again. This is going to be game two. This time, though, it's against Ops on Aggro. Jacob was on the play for game one. And this is going to be the configuration for the rest of the match. The players have gone to their sideboards. It's a little more resiliency in Jason's deck. For Jacob, he has changed up the kind of answers he has. But at the same time, this is still a battle of two Siege Rhino decks. You oftentimes hear people say you want to be just a little bit bigger than your opponent, and that's really what Jacob has done. Yeah, and it's not like Jason's appreciably faster. I mean, he's a little bit faster, but most of his openings, Jacob can blunt pretty easily with his own removal spells. We start out on a, ta on a tap land for Jason. He did start the last game on two copies of Sandstep Citadel, and when it was Jacob making the first creature, you felt like Jason Coleman never really had pressure. Exactly. It's not like a turn three courser against an empty board determines the game by any stretch. But even on that opening, it just felt like Jason was going to be really far behind for most of the game, and, and he was. Let's see if he has a two drop. He does. It's going to be Fleece Main Lion for Jason as he goes back over to Jacob's second turn. For Jacob, it'll be a thought seize. We'll see what what the curve is for Jason. We see Abzan Charm, Rakshasa Death Dealer, and three more lands. It had a good two drops, but it's a little light on pressure after that. Still nice for Jason to be op able to open up on two drop into true drop next turn and then have Abzan Charm with available mana after that. You would like one of these lands to become a spell, really. This is a solid hand. Thoughtseize does do a lot of work here, either taking away Jason's ability to fire back after playing his two drop or taking the second creature. These are the kind of hands where Thoughtseize is really punishing. Where Jason does have a very good curve. He's got a good script for the first couple games, for the first couple turns, excuse me, but he just is a little spell light, and Thoughtseize is very punishing. He'll go ahead and take the Ops on Charm. A lot of this, I think, is leading up to the fact, you see there's a Siege Rhino hiding in Jason's hand, or Jacob's hand, rather. Siege Rhino answers Jason's board right now. Yep. Police main line will knock Jacob Wilson down to 15. For Jason, he has the Death Dealer and some lands. He'll play the Temple. Just needs some support for his early game creatures. Keeping a card on top so he finds something he likes. And actually, because of that basic planes, he cannot play Rakshasa Death Dealer. That was a very expensive Temple to play as opposed to a Pain Land that turn. This does trip up Abzan Nagro from time to time. The mana base is just a little shaky. 
<laughs> to put it mildly. I mean, you're playing with Rakshasha Death Dealer in Plains. You have Anafenza the Foremost in Basic Lands in your deck. It's, it's, you're going to stumble like this sometimes. For Jacob Wilson, he's going to set up a turn three, cracking a fetch land here. Looking toward his three drops. Does have cards like Hero's Downfall, Corsair of Crufix. We know he has a turn four Siege Rhino. We'll see what he's going to set up for it with. And it's just going to be Seder Wayfinder. And what this would say, okay, if he's going to play Windswept Teeth, crack it just to play Seder Wayfinder. The read here is that he has Murderous Cut in his hand. If he, any other way he would have tapped for that by not cracking a fetch land, he would not have a black mana or the other single black devil spell, Tassiger. Yeah, it would have to be, you know, something like Thoughtseize or one of his single black delve cards, Tassiger or Murderous Cut. You see, there's just a lot of power into play for Jacob. And that was one of the points you mentioned. You said, you know, they're playing a lot of the same cards. And while Jason's faster, he's not appreciably faster. If you look at what they made in the first three turns, Jason had a Fleece Mane Lion. Jacob has a Wayfinder and a Tassiger. That's Jason, for, for being the aggro deck here, he's not significantly faster. And part of the problem now is Jason's in a spot where, you know, if he adds something to his board, it means he's not attacking. And Jacob gets to add something to his own board. And if Jason is using removal spells, well, that's his whole turn. And three damage a turn is not very much. Now, uh, Jacob's hand is a little bit light on action. A follow-up removal spell here on the Tassiker puts him in an okay position. Yeah, Thoughts he takes the Siege Rhino, and he does have the hero's downfall for Tasker. And that, that was very important to think in this hand. He needs to be able to keep attacking. And now, next turn, you know, Jacob's most likely scenario is he plays the course of Crucifix in his hand. If Jason has an untapped fifth land, then he can go monsters with the fleece main lion. That means it can't be killed anymore. It also means that the course of Crucifix can't block it effectively. And then at that point, you know, Jacob needs help. All right. Jacob's draw for the turn was Hero's Downfall, so he's going to go ahead and use that to take care of Fleece Main Line while he still can, play Sandstep Citadel for the turn, and then swing in for one. So both players really playing off the top of the deck. Four lands in play each, hands full of lands. Jacob has a Corsair in hand. Coleman has a Rakshasa Death Dealer. That was a really important draw there for Jacob, because if he misses that turn, if it's a land or maybe a more expensive spell, uh, Fleece Main Line going monstrous on that board is, is problematic for what Jacob had, and a lot of his draws to remove it then gets shut off. Yeah, timely hero's downfall for Jacob Wilson. And eventually, Jacob will just have will is looking to make parody and hope that his the fact that he plays more powerful cards will eventually pull him ahead. Yeah, it's a good script. I mean, Jason still has power in his own deck. We know he's he sided into most likely some of his late game cards. He still has his two copies of Wingate Rock. If he's able to trigger a raid on that, that's problematic for Jacob as well. But uh, draw step to draw step from this position, Jacob is going to do much better on average. Here's Rakshasa, Death Dealer. And that planes, once again, means he can't hold up regeneration mana. So instead, it'll be a Delve spell. It'll be his copy of Tassiger. So great pair of threats for Coleman. Exactly. I mean, right now, Jason's playing. Uh, they're both playing almost exactly the same tools right now. And Jason getting the better end of it. Can Jacob kill the Tassiger before it starts drawing Jason cards? His draw for the turn was another copy of Hero's Downfall. Now, it's great for Jacob that he found a downfall, but uh, there's still two problematic threats on Jason's side of the table here. So he's going to need more help beyond this, though. Uh, very good for him that he drew it. Yeah, I mean, these are two straight draws for Jacob of Hero's Downfalls when he has really needed one. And he'll decide to go against, take out the Tassiger past the turn. With both these players in top deck mode, I think that Tassiger is just not a card that Jacob can leave in play. He's got a, a chump block for the Death Dealer if he wants it. And if he draws to something like Elspeth, that completely contains Rush out of Death Dealer. So uh, Death Dealer does deal more damage potentially, but I think he's better served getting Tassiker off the table that previous turn. He has some life points to work with as far as damage is concerned. You know, he can wait until he draws to something like this Sidisi that he sees on top, whereas cards be are a sig more significant problem. Yeah. With both these players basically being on empty. And on tap here. So Jacob at 12. Got a life gain off that Courser. And we go back to Jason, 12 to 15. Rakshasa Death Dealer against Corsair of Krufix. Seems even until you look at the top of Jacob's library, that Sidisi is the, the type of card that really Jason doesn't have in this matchup. Well, his analog in this spot is Wingmate Rock. If he finds it on this turn, it's excellent for him, and Sidisi might be a little bit too slow. 
Swing here for Death Dealer, not blocked. He'll deal four, Jacob down to eight. And Jason passing. One of his two remaining cards is a land. Sidisi drawn for Jacob, his top card is Bio Blight. And this is a little weird spot here for Jacob because Bio Blight's a fine draw next turn. It does muck things up a little bit on Jason's side of the table. So he's got the option of, do I hold back on casting Sidisi here, drawing Bio Blight next turn, and then use Sidisi to tutor? Do I cast Sidisi and tutor with it and know that I'm not drawing Bio Blight next turn? Or do I just cast a DC and don't exploit and just say, okay, I have a 4 6 Death Tusher. I'm drawing Bioplight next turn, and the damage race is pretty good for me. There's a lot of different ways for Jacob to play this turn. Yeah, his, I believe his other card is a copy of Urborg. So he has the opportunity here to, uh, to kind of pick his line. He can, he can tutor if he wants to. He can tutor next turn if he wants to. He can just place a DC as a 4 6. Yeah, while Bioblade doesn't kill Rakshasa Death Dealer outright, it's usually good enough to kill it because to keep a Death Dealer alive through Bioblade basically means you're committed to never pumping it or never playing other spells. It's, a, it's not a straightaway answer when Jason has this amount of mana, but it takes a lot of the wind out of its sails. Right. I think Jacob going to go for the third option. He's not, not going to play the land, not going to play the CDC. He will just pass. I think part of the reason he doesn't want to play the Urborg here is because Jason is stuck on a Plains. Plains doesn't do anything to pump the Death Dealer, but if that Plains gets turned to a Swamp, suddenly it's much easier for Jason to cobble together, you know, two pumps plus leave up regeneration mana in one turn. Yeah, single pump here puts Jacob down to four. Now here's an Urborg. Now Jason actually had his last turn, his hand was two lands. It was that Urborg and the Fetch Land. So if, if he's making his land drops earlier, maybe he can push some additional damage. Jacob at, at a very tight for life, but maybe, but I think he's stabilized. Yeah. Obs on charm, the next draw for Jacob Wilson. Now he'll go for Sadisi. We'll see if he does exploit here or just makes a 4-6. I think that I like exploiting here because between a 4-6 Death Toucher and a Bio Blight, you should have that Death Dealer contain, and I'm sure you can convert that Courser into a much more powerful card. Well, he didn't attack with the Courser first, which makes me think he's not going to exploit it. In response to the CDC, here's... Yeah, he, he did not exploit the CDC. Here's me, Hero's Downfall on it. He bio blights away the Rakshasa Death Dealer and then swings with Corsair. And I'm not sure, I, I'm not even positive in that spot as a big draw here for Jason and we may rock that. Uh, I think that Jacob might have been happy with that exchange and trying to induce it a little bit. His top card, pardon, was another copy of Corsair, not the Obson Charm. That is sitting out in exile. So second Corsair for Jacob. See, Sidisi is the following card. It's going to be a swing from wing, wing mate, Wingmate Rock, putting Jacob down to two. He does have a Sidisi, so at the very least, if he doesn't see a land on top, he can... Well, no, if, he, if that next card's a land, he'll life gain his way up to four. Well, he also can Sidisi into something like a removal spell, like Murderous Cut or Ultimate Price, and stabilize that way. That was a one-turn window there where Jason could have drawn Siege Rhino. He could have drawn even Obzon Charm and put together Lethal. Now it's going to get a lot harder. Yeah, here's Sidisi drawn. That light land has Jacob going in life gain up to four. This time, Sidisi will be exploited. It's going to sacrifice a Corsair of Crew Fix. And I have to imagine he's just getting a one-mana removal spell for the Wingmate Rock. He doesn't want to risk taking another hit here as it turns on a lot of lethal cards on the other side of the table. Yeah, things like a Siege Rhino would just outright kill him if he drops to three. And Jason down to 10. If Jacob can answer this wingmate, that may just be good enough. And there's, there's so many things that can go differently here. So 
even if you go all the way back to the turn where Jacob played his first Sidisi, and J Jason Hero's downfalls it, and then Jacob Bile blights away the Rakshasa Death Dealer. If Jason Hero's downfalls on his own turn, he'll draw the Wingmate Rock, get to see that that doesn't happen, can swing the Death Dealer, get two, three, four flyers, and maybe that makes the difference. I think in that spot, Jason needed to do a little bit more to jam up Jacob. Uh, I think that even though he didn't get to exploit that turn, Jacob got to have a pretty efficient turn and get the Death Dealer off the table. And hostility is the top card for Jacob. He did go get Murder's Cut off Sidisi. That took care of the 3 4 flyer. And now it is uncontested six power in play for Jacob. He'll go ahead and swing. Both players now at four. Hand hostilities in Jacob's hand. Bio Blight on top. He'll pass the turn. Can Jason even it up? And no, two lands won't do it. We're on to game three. Jacob Wilson with a 2 0 lead. Jason's flooded out there towards the end. But uh, again, it's uh, Jacob's just. The, the terms of engagement from both sides of the table are pretty similar here, and Jacob's deck does do it a lot better. And we did see Jason hold off on lands on one turn, not wanting to give Jacob an Urborg. It did cost him a pump on the Rakshasa Death Dealer. There's a couple of situations where I thought Jason was... He, he had a balance between protecting his Death Dealer and dealing a lot of damage, and in this situation, I think Jacob just... He out-sequenced just, just enough there to pull ahead. And there's also an issue of Jason wanting to conceal some of his draw steps there, because... Even though he's not drawing a threat card, it doesn't mean he's necessarily drawing a land either because there's a lot of reactive cards in his deck. So he has some incentive there to leave stuff in his hand just to get Jacob thinking maybe he drew Hero's Downfall or something similar. But uh, in that spot, I think Jason, because it's so much of his game plan just hubs around Rakshasa Death Dealer, he just kind of needs to play his lands out, give a little bit of his uh, ability to bluff there because just having more mana in play is so important. All right. We are currently in the semifinals here at our Invitational. This is the first one of the season in Richmond. Now, we have a full four Invitationals during the year. We've walked you through the second and third quarter schedule. But if you're out on the West Coast and wanting to play in an Invitational, we are returning once again to Seattle, and that's with our co fourth quarter of Star City Games events. So those start in September. We have them in each format. Starts with Modern in Cincinnati. Then we move over to Worcester again for standard. Milwaukee will be standard. A standard open in Indianapolis to begin October. After that, we have a standard open series in Atlanta. Two weeks after that, a legacy open in St. Louis. Return to Dallas and Philadelphia for a modern and standard open. After that, we head to Atlanta for a limited Grand Prix. We'll have more information about that as we get closer to the event. Two weeks after that, a Legacy Open Series in New Jersey. We go back to Denver the, for the first time in several years to start off December. Then the Season 4 Invitational in Seattle, a Standard and Modern Invitational with a Standard Open Series December 11th through 13th. And then, of course, to wrap up the year, the Players' Championship in Roanoke, Virginia, December 19th and 20th. Yeah, and if you notice, for that Invitational in Seattle, you see Standard and Modern. As Modern has been added as one of our Open Series events this year, it also comes to the Invitationals. This two of our Invitationals this year, the one we've seen this weekend and the third one, which is in New Jersey, they are a mix of legacy and standard. However, for the second and fourth quarters, that's if you're in Columbus or in Seattle, they will be mixing modern and standard for the first time. And we're really happy about that, especially given the reception we got in Baltimore, which was a huge open, our first ever two-day 20K modern open series event. We got more coming out the, throughout the rest of the year. Two of our invitationals will feature modern as one of the primary formats. And uh, so far, the response has been great, both in terms of attendance and viewership numbers for those events. So. More modern, the better. Yeah, so going on to game three, Jason is going to have to run the table against Jacob Wilson if he wants to make it to the finals where Reed Duke awaits. First one will be the easy one. He'll get to be on the play. What are the keys here, though? We saw a pair of two drops and an Obzon charm in the keep there for Jason. A pretty solid hand against Obzon control, but still, once the cards started trading, you, you couldn't help but notice that Jacob's were just higher impact. Exactly. I think the real key in the matchup, I think Jason's best shot assuming that both players have functional draws as Wingmate Rock. It's not an easy card for Jacob to answer. Elspeth doesn't do a lot against it. Spot removal doesn't do a lot against it. He doesn't block it very effectively. He's only got the one copy of End Hostilities to board in. So uh, Jason has not been able to, to get that going yet. He, he's been able to cast it, but not, not for the preferred mode. Uh, that's his best card. The, the other kind of things that can get going is just a fast draw, have Jacob stumble out the gates a little bit. Jason has a couple power cards of his own, like his own copy of Elspeth, if the game goes very long. So he can try to play a facsimile of Jacob's game, though I think he's behind in that sort of matchup. The, the card that stands out to me the most is We May Rock. I think that's his best card. Yeah, and to that effect, if you're Jacob, you need to keep the board clean so that we saw Jason play Wingmate Rot last game. It wasn't so bad because it didn't come with a second 3-4. But if he gets that 6 power in the air, that's where the danger is. But a 3-4 flyer was almost enough to finish off that game. Even a non-rated Wingmate Rock was significant. So 
I, I think that's a card that Jacob has to keep his eye out for. He's going to prevent Jason from getting into combat once Jason is threatening five mana as much as he possibly can. He'll probably high, value it very highly off of his thought seasons if they happen to be in Jason's hand. It's, it's the swing card in the matchup from Jason's side of the table. Now, one card that Jason does have we haven't seen yet. We saw it a lot last match with Chris Anderson. He still has that one copy of Mastery over the Unseen out of his sideboard. That is another card that if we get into these removal wars it can do a lot of work for Jason. But keep in mind, Jason's not playing with something like Nykthos. He's playing it a lot more honest, and uh, it is a valuable card for him to have in the matchup. I'm sure he'd be happy to draw it, but it's nowhere near the same power level as it is in something like Green-White Devotion, where you can generate a boatload of mana and make an army on your own. It, it's good if Jason's got other stuff going on, or if Jacob's, Jacob's hand is all spot removal, uh, but it in and of itself does not result in the win. All right, well, Jason has a seven that he likes for game three. We'll see if Jacob does as well. Jacob Wilson currently 5-0 and oh in games here in the top eight. A 3-0 victory over Ross Merriam. Looking if he can repeat that against Jason, Jason Coleman. Which is very impressive because if you remember the tale of the tape, Jacob did not have a spectacular run through standard. He was 5-3. and three. And both players on seven for the third time. Starting off with a pair of tap lands. So once does Jason have a two drop? We saw him have both of them last game. His mana got in the way of him aggroing out Jacob. And this will be Rakshasa Death Dealer. Yeah, that Plains was brutal that Jason had the open hand there. Help with the Fleece main line, not with the Death Dealer. And we, given how close that game was, you wonder if that was all the difference. Yeah, well, I think it was a situation where it was, it was just a slight oversight on Jason's side. He played the tap land, and I think the moment he played it, he realized that he didn't have, that he had the Plains. But this time, he'll get to see what he's up against. We'll get a thought seize on Jacob's hand. We'll get a spread here for you momentarily. It looks like we have Lanwar Wastes, Temple of Silence, Corsair of Crufrix. Yeah, we'll get them all in a second. Siege Rhino, Abzan Charm appear to be in the hand as well. Yeah, Abzan Charm, Tassiger, Siege Rhino, Murderous Cut. A pretty solid lineup once again for Jacob. This is the type of hand where you know, Jacob has no immediate answer to the Death Dealer, so that's a win for Jason, but this is going to be a challenging hand to slog through again. There's no real critical card in the hand. There's no hole to open up. There's multiple threads, multiple answers. And Jason's going to have to squeeze a lot out of this Death Dealer. There is the immediate threat in terms of Corsair. There's the other threat in terms of Siege Rhino and maybe Tassiger. And a kill spell and a draw spell. Or perhaps a second kill spell. Yep. Siege Rhino will be the take. Always a decent card to take from Obs on decks. And he'll swing with Death Dealer. See if he opts to pump. Instead, he'll go with a second Death Dealer. I yeah, didn't see Bioblight, so willing to risk it. Definitely like it, a pair of 2-2s two there. Jacob, he'll play Corsair of Crufix. Now, when we last saw his hand, he did not have an untapped land for but finds one on top of the deck, Caves of Goylos. And I like this path from Jason here. He is risking Bioblight, but uh, I think given the quality of Jacob's hand, but it is a little bit on the slow side, his best plan here is just to beat Jacob up. And you know, you, you risk Bioblight, but I think he's going to be pretty aggressive here in pumping and trying to close this game out before Jacob can do much with the cards in his hand. Well, here's swing the two Death Dealers. Jacob not really able to block as a black and green are open, so he'll drop down to 13. Fourth land on Jason's side. He'll crack it and see what the follow-up here is here. He'd love to keep the pressure on with something like Siege Rhino. Very interesting to see Jason here get a Plains, as the Plains does not do anything to help the Death Dealer. You wonder if he's already got Wingmate Rock in hand if he's digging for double white like this. Yeah, that's the only... Right, he does have the Siege Rhino, so Jacob will drop down to 10. This is... a great amount of pressure from Jason. Yeah, and now Jacob's in a spot where, yeah, go ahead. You, you know, Jason can say, go ahead, untap and kill one of my guys. I don't really care uh, because uh, Jacob's not in a position to put multiple spells into play in one turn, and he's ahead on the board right now. And if you're in Jacob's spot, you think, okay, he fetched for a plains, not for a forest. And I'm thinking exactly what you thought. A forest looks like the better option here, and the only reason he'd get plains is if he has a double white spell. And you kind of just have to hope he doesn't have Wingmate Rock. I'm not sure you can beat it if you're Jacob. Well, the, the only other option is that it's Elspeth, which is almost equally bad news. Uh, Jacob is still drawing to the one copy of End Hostilities, depending on how Jason uses his mana with the Death Dealer next turn. But uh, Jacob is up against the ropes right now. 
Yeah, I mean, if he decides to send Hostilities or Bust, you may just see him obs on Charm for it. He knows the next draw is Siege Rhino. Either way, it's going to be Sandstep Citadel for Jacob. He'll go to 11. Saving his untapped land for another turn. Does have that Caves of Koilos. We know other cards in his hand. Does have Obs on Charm. Has Murderous Cut. And he'll just pass. If he suspects Wingmate Rock next turn, it's, he's got to find that end hostilities. No question about it. Or he can just offer up a block here on the Death Dealer and jam up Jason's mana at least a little bit. Yep. Corsair will jump in front of Death Dealer. Will Jason want to make a play to save it? He knows if he pumps it, it could get Obs on Charmed or Mer So there, there's risk. So this is a very interesting little cat and mouse game. If Jason passes here, he's saying to Jacob, I believe, I have Wingmate Rock and I don't care if I lose a Death Dealer. At that point, it becomes pretty attractive for Jacob to use a removal spell like Obs on Charm on the Siege Rhino to really take, you know, the Wingmate Rock does get raided, but at least Jacob gets two things off the table. And but it would Jacob, cost him his Corsair if he did it. Well, potentially. So now he does this. Now Jason has the option to pump if he wants to, and Jacob loses quite a bit. But it does keep the Wingmate Rock off the table for this turn. So he will Obs on Charm to take care of the Siege Rhino. Jason will take the Corsair, pumping his Death Dealer. That was a very interesting line of play from both players there. Once Jason passes, Jacob has a pretty big incentive there to kill the Siege Rhino because at that point it's either uh, Death Dealer dies and you face a wait rated Wingmate Rock or um, Jason pumps and it's his whole turn. A Temple of Malady for Jason. I don't believe he has the Wingmate Rock. Just two cards remaining. That plane's really hampering his Death Dealers again. Well, it's okay because he's still on four lands that do activate. Yeah, if he goes to land number six, it's problematic, but... Yeah, I mean, that turn, that turn it hurt, I think. You're right, now he has four, so on his next attack, he'll be fine. Well, on, on top of that, getting that planes, whether or not Jason was just trying to set up for Wingmate Rock or potentially bluffing it, I think it did cause Jacob to play a pretty funky turn there because that had to be on his radar given the way that he blocked and the way that he used the Obzon charm. Well, for Jacob, we know the draw was another Siege Rhino. May just be enough to stabilize. Jacob is at eight right now. It's low, but it's not perilously low. He could just stabilize with creatures. He's got a window here to take care of one of the death dealers. He doesn't have enough to play Siege Rhino and cut in the same turn. He's only got three cards in his graveyard. That would have been a huge turn for something like Windswept Heath. Yeah, fetch line would be great. Starts with Temple, deciding on the scry. He'll keep it on top and just go for a blocker. This is going to be another Siege Rhino. But with two sets of black green mana in play, this is a difficult position for Siege Rhino. If Jacob makes a block, Jason can pump one up to a 6-6. Six six. Though for as good as this is going for Jason, and right now he's, he's definitely in the driver's seat, feels like the first game where he's got a very good shot of winning. If he doesn't have Hero's Downfall in hand, all it takes is Elspeth. This could all get undone. I mean, Jacob is buying, by making this block, and he blocks one of the Death Dealers with Siege Rhino, he's offering up the Rhino for free, but at the cost of Jason's turn, which time is something that Jacob is well, willing to pay cards for. Siege Rhino gaining three, and now, well, gaining six if Jason makes this pump. A nine-point life gain spell for four is something Jacob's interested in. Uh, Jason still, uh, Jacob rather, still needs a powerful follow-up to rationalize this line of play. I mean, he's buying some time right now, but this is still not a solution. And hostility, it's Elspeth. Uh, he is now in a position where his murderous cut can take one, care of one of them, so two removal spells it could be good here. So Jacob, close to stabilizing, still needs a little bit of help. All right, the Death Dealer goes all the way up to a 6-6. Six, six. It eats the Siege Rhino. He swings in for two. Jacob's down to nine. Had gained three off Rhino, and post-combat, Jason will scry again with another temple. This will stay on top. And Jacob has expended a tremendous amount of resources handling these death dealers. It's not even clear he gets to handle both of them right now. With that set, and we've seen now two chump blocks with a Corsair crew fix and a Siege Rhino. Jacob still has draws that undo everything that Jason has done up until this point. Yeah, Bio Blight and End Hostilities being the best ones. Even just two kill spells will seem okay here. Yep. Then you're playing, you know, top of deck to top of deck. Yeah, life and totals are even about the same. Yeah. We know that Jacob plays that game better than Jason.
Jacob, it looks like a question, question for one of the judges. Perhaps some chatter on the rails. Jacob asking for a little bit of silence there. It looks like he may lead. We will see. It's going to be a copy of Tassiger. He's going to delve away everything. Play land and just pass the turn. This is not... Well, it's not the one I expected him to take, but well, this is interesting. I think the, I, I think it's kind of the... Uh, he's applying a similar philosophy here that we saw in the previous turn, which he's saying, all right, it's going to take Jason's entire turn to push through this thing. I get an opportunity to activate Tassiker, get another look at one of my haymakers. At that point, I get several cards in the graveyard, so the murderous cut gets more efficient down the line. So this is probably, if his, if his hand's Tassiker or murderous cut, he has to choose between one, or the, one of the two that turn. And if he just plays Murderous Cut, while well, there's still an unchecked Death Dealer, Jason's going to be able to untap, attack for a bunch, and leave mana up to regenerate. So Jacob's still on a, on a collision, on the sort of path where he's saying, well, I need to find Elspeth, or I need to find something big. And this play devours Jason's turn yet again, and gives him an opportunity to find one of those cards. Well, this is a danger zone. Here's a swing. Jacob blocks with Tasker, and rather than pumping to try to eat it, Jason just regenerates the one that was blocked. So five mana are still up. And we'll see just what it is that Jason has. Two cards remain in his hand. Looks like he's going to tap three, still leaving up two. It's going to be Anafenza the Foremost. He puts Jacob down to seven. Now, I actually really like this turn for Jacob. He only took two damage, and he got a Tassiger activation off of it. And Tassiger will draw my hero's downfall. Though a lot of Jacob's activations now with Tassiger don't yield anything because of the Anafenza. It's true. Hannah Fenza with that secondary ability that is so good against the Sultai. Cannot put creatures into graveyards. But finding a downfall is a, a, big, a big win here. And, you know, Jason's got to commit a lot of mana to all of his attacks here. Or he's kind of chump attacking or he's just regenerating and not dealing that much damage. So Jacob is starting to get to a spot here where he's going to be able to chain together multiple removal spells in one turn. If Jason goes for big pumps, Jacob can do a lot to disrupt that. Here's going to be the hero's downfall from Jacob. It'll take care of Anna Fenza. And that puts a second card in his graveyard. So now with the three men available, that gives him access to Murderous Cut. Yeah, but we're reaching that point in the game where these Rakshasa Death Dealers are serious business. Oh, they are, they are awesome. I mean... <laughs> Eight mana in play now for Jason. Four sources of green and Urborg. This is four Death Dealer activations. They were, this is tough for Jacob to deal with. And that said, life totals are still pretty even. If Jacob can, can par parry for a couple turns, he can do something like make a Siege Rhino and actually just threaten Jason back. And or, Jacob's still in a position where Elspeth, again, may just undo just all of this. You know, and that's what I really like about these OBS on deck. You see these control decks like Sultai that really are just on defense the whole game. So Jacob is playing defensively, but because his cards are just so efficient, like Siege Rhino and Tassiger, the OBS on control deck transitions into offense so beautifully. That's also facilitated by the fact that Jason's doing a lot of damage to himself over the course of the game here as well. So here's Death Dealer. It'll be blocked by Tassiger. Jason, going to go ahead and use a Death Dealer activation. One on each. Unblocked one, becoming a 4-4. Four, four. I think Jason's just saying, I'm regenerating the one that you block. He wants to keep up as much mana as possible to be able to play through removal spells. He's taking a slightly slower pace of the game here. Jacob now will go for that Obzon charm. We've seen that around the entire game. Jason has known about it as well. It's going to exile the 4-4 four, four Death Dealer. Now that Jacob is tapped out, we'll see if Jason wants to spend all his mana, he could kill the Tassiker. Doesn't do it, though. Just going to play another Death Dealer. This is a balancing act, right? So Jason could have tapped out there to kill Tassiger, but then, of course, it's dead to any kill spell. Yeah, and uh, at that, it's his entire turn, and then he's playing top of deck to top of deck. This is still... Right, it's really unappealing. But then again, leaving Jacob with all this mana and a Tassiger, that's... I mean, right, if you look at the graveyard, I don't really want to give Jacob back either of those cards from Jason. Yeah, Jason, uh, the line of play he seems to be pursuing here is Elspeth's big trouble for me if it shows up. But if it doesn't, there's not a lot this Tasker can find otherwise. 
You know, nice. Jason, you've seen him attack, regenerate the one that blocks, and pump a little bit on the unblocked one. Maybe he's giving Jacob an extra turn or two this way, but he's turning off a lot of the cards that Jacob could find off this Tasker. The spot removal spells do not help all that much. Well, here's a swing. He'll go ahead and regenerate the blocked Death Dealer. He'll pump the unblocked, run the same play as last turn. Will Jacob expend a kill spell here? Well, this is the, the really dangerous Flashpoint, too, because this Death Dealer that's going unblocked is knocking Jacob down to three, and that's Siege Rhino territory. Yeah, and the thing is, because he has this card advantage, Jacob actually has option to some interesting plays, like simply activating Tassiger, getting a card back, and then using, say, a Murderous Cut in his hand to just fog the unblocked Death Dealer. And he's saying, okay, well, I, I burned a card, but I did get a free card. We'll just keep playing that for a while. Exactly. And on the other side of the equation, you know, uh, if, if Jacob is able to stave off lethal and then draw a big card, he gets to just transition to offense very quickly. If he draws something like Siege Rhino, you can see something like untap, attack you with Tassiker, play Siege Rhino, and now you're the one looking at lethal next turn, potentially. And this is exactly the play Jacob's making. He's going to go ahead and murderous cut the Death Dealer. Jason will regenerate. And now what Jacob has to decide, he has a Tassiker activation available for him. Does he want to do it before or after the murderous cut is in the graveyard? If he mills two lands, he'll want the murderous cut in the graveyard. Otherwise, he will not want it there. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. You know, if there's two cards in the graveyard from the Tassiker activation, he's got seven mana total, so they can activate Tassiker and murderous cut again. And activated in response to the murderous cut, and that did work out the way which he didn't want it to. It milled two lands, then cut went to the graveyard. Yeah, Jacob going for broke there and hoping to get one of his real big plays. Right. This was the only downside to, to, to sequencing it that way. It's, it's pretty unfortunate. Yeah, it's a go-for-broke play. I mean, Jacob's trying to give himself the maximum opportunity to find Elspeth, uh, you know, maybe Ugin if he boarded in. I'm not sure if it's in there, but uh, he has some real big hits in that spot. That's what he's looking for. All right, well, Tassiger will go again. Seder, Wayfinder, and Murderous Cut. Well, he'll get the Wayfinder. That would be fair. If he's using his kill spells to fog an attacker, Seder Wayfinder is not actually that different than Murderous Cut. Yep. Although now Jason has to worry much less about Jacob being able to play back at him and inside of combat. And you may see Jason finally pump this dealer, death dealer to a 6-6 and take care of Tassiger. Yeah. Jacob uh, milling a Corsair with the Wayfinder. Finds a land, but a fetch land, but just plays a temple. These death dealers. Jason has been playing the death dealers very conservatively here, not wanting them to die. And is getting rewarded. Now, Jacob's seen a lot of cards in this deck. There's a lot of points where this could have gone wrong. But you're right. We're eventually getting to this spot where I think Jason can safely kill the Tassiker. Jacob with one man remaining. He'll thought sees. He sees a land. And now with Jacob at five, he is definitely tapped out. He is priced into blocking both death yep. dealers. And, and Jason has the option here of finally cleaning out this Tassiker. Uh, though, you know, you saw Jason's hand there. It's a land. So Ugin, Elspeth, uh, they are very live draws right now. Yep. Jacob has one turn to find him, though. Can he do it? Here's land number nine. Both Death Dealers swing in. Jacob, yep, all right, I'll block them both. For Jason, this is pretty easy. Makes the Death Dealer 6-6 six, six to kill Tassiger. The 2-2 two, two will kill a 1-1. One, one. And there we have it. Take care of Jacob's creatures. And the mana left over to regenerate both. Yep. That plan of just protect the Death Dealers working this game. Another reason to be that Jason's being very cautious here is because of Bio Blight. It's not just the big spells, too. There's a small one that could have been really disastrous for him if he ever tapped too low. And now Jacob draw passes the turn. A swing of two Death Dealers from Jason. Jacob says, okay, you're going to go for the broke. You're going to kill. Uh, Pump uh, one of them. Yep, all right. Here's six power. Can you deal with it? I was going to say, that's, I mean... I like the Jason's approach with the Death Dealer, but not attacking for lethal here is a little too conservative for my taste. And Jacob drawing the Bio Blight finally, just a little late. It's going to shrink down that Death Dealer into... Now, this is on the stack. It represents basically minus six over the course of the two Death Dealers, but with enough pump here, this shouldn't matter. Jason going to pump three more times. That adds six power. This is still six points of damage coming through. Yeah, J he's saying to Jacob, you need a follow-up spell here. If, you know, maybe he had another copy of Bio Blight. Be excellent here, but uh, it would be weird if Jacob had two Bio Blights in his hand at this stage. Or the easy way to look at it is Bio Blight knocks three power off each of them. Jason just tapped six mana. That adds six power, so those two cancel out. We're back to the point where he had two, two Death Dealers, and one of them's pumped, so yep. it's still six. Jacob just confirming the size of each of them. 
And that will be enough. Jason Coleman does take a game off Jacob Wilson. I mean, that's the game plan there that doesn't involve women, Rock, is, uh, you know, Jacob had a draw there. And, and that's got to be that's gotta be what feels good about Jason. It's not for, the, for that game. It's not like Jacob missed land drops or didn't have a draw. He couldn't play back. Jason was able to find a line to play with those death dealers where a lot of Jacob's tools were blunted. I mean, he couldn't efficiently use his cards like Hero's Downfall. Jason played a pretty conservative game there. He wasn't trying to kill Jacob as fast as possible. And as a result, he risked giving Jacob a lot of looks at something like Elspeth Sun's Champion or Ugin if it's in his deck. Uh, but the upshot was Bioblades, Hero's Downfalls, they weren't really that effective. Yeah, and, and I think if you're Jacob Wilson, you're still not too disappointed in how you played that game. What I like about his line is it really countered the line Jason played. So Jason played a, lot, a game of protect the death dealers. And while that's a very robust game plan, it's slow. So what Jacob said is, okay, if you're going to play it slow and give me a lot of turns, I'm going to play a slow game where I just, instead of maybe trying to blow all my resources to kill one of your death dealers, I'm going to play slow too. I'm going to fog you with these removal spells. I'm going to find an Elspeth, and then I'm not going to care about your death dealers. Now, did he find one? No, he didn't end up drawing one, but I do think that line of play will work more often than not. Yeah, Jason basically got to control the, the terms of engagement that game and said, I'm protecting these death dealers at all costs. That's a very slow game plan. It means that a lot of, of Jacob's removal spells aren't effective, but the upshot is Jacob has a lot of time, and as such, he was able to get multiple activations out of Tassiker there, went for a, a line of play there to go broke, where if you know he flips over land plus Elspeth, even something like Fleecebane Lion would have been very powerful there given the line of play that Jason took, but all Jacob found was lands and removal spells, and given Jason's line of play, those spells were not very helpful for Jacob. Yeah. Jacob had a lot of cards to hit. He could hit either of his two Elspeths, Fleece Main Lions if he had them. His copy of Garuk would have been, or Garruk would have been very good here. Uh, even his two copies of Sidisi Undead Vizier, that is, is basically Elspeths number three and four. The, the pro a lot of those cards are very powerful, but the other side of it is, if Jacob ever kind of screws around for too long, doesn't have removal spells at the ready, what's also nice about the line of play that Jason took is he can just go attack you for lethal. I mean, he's not committed yeah. to just leaving up the mana the entire game. If Jacob pursues a line of play that's too slow or there's warning signs that he's developing towards something big, like something like Sidisi shows up, he has the two death dealers, and Jacob needs two blockers at that stage because both of them are coming across for lethal. I mean, that's the Rakshasa death dealer game, is you're trading mana with your opponent. If one, if there's these death dealers in play and one player decides to hold up in a lot of mana, it really forces the other player to do the same. And we saw that lots of mana not being spent by either player because if one person tapped out, the other person had a great response. Exactly. Jason doesn't want to tap out because that opens up the line for murderous cuts and heroes downfall to take care of the Rakshasa death dealer. And Jacob doesn't want to tap out because the minute his shields are down, Jason can just go... Attack you, pump for a bunch, you're dead. So Jason, on the scoreboard with game three. As we said after game two, he's going to have to run the table if he wants to get to the finals. He got the one, easy one. That's the one where he's on the play. On the draw, this can become much harder. Yep, it's going to be an uphill battle, but it's, it's got to feel good for Jason there to get a game where Jacob had a real draw. You know, yeah, that's, Jacob's draw was good. You know, in a matchup that's in a matchup like this where Jason's, you know, definitely behind 75 cards to 75 cards, uh, you know, you're kind of hoping, all right, I get one or two of them straight up. Maybe he mulligans a bunch of one of the games. And, and being able to get one of the ones that on the straight up level, it feels real good. Yeah. Now, what will be the challenge for these post-board games is we saw game one. Jacob was on the play. The f Jason Coleman started out with two Sandstep Citadels that game. And it was actually Jacob who made the first creature. It was Corsair of Crufix. And as early as turn three there, you just looked at the board and saw Jacob with the first creature. It's a defensive 2-4. He was going to get him card advantage. It seemed so hard for Jason to come back, and it was even just turn three. And, it, and Jason even had, was able to put a Death Dealer into play and use Dramoka's Command to get off the, the Courser. It wasn't so much that the Courser did a lot of work. It was just Jason was behind, and Jason's cards are less powerful. So he's got to try to stay in front the entire game. Yeah, I mean, both players are good at trading cards. So we talked about this actually in Legacy, too. Jason wants to get ahead and then see some trades happen, whereas Jacob would like to just see the trades happen first, and then he'll get ahead later. Yep. So, so if we're already in the trading port part of the game and nothing's going on on the board, that's not a good spot for Jason. Exactly. When, the, when there's one thing in play, and that thing is getting targeted by Hero's downfall, when, it, that, when it's Jacob's downfall, that's really good. When it's Jason's downfall, that's not nearly as good for Jason's side of the table. Jason wants a thing or two in play and then to start casting his hero's downfalls. Yeah, absolutely. And in that situation, though, so we did see a different line of approach, though. Not able to 
really get out to be too aggressive there. What Jason did is he, he made the game about something else. Instead of making it about raw resources, he made it about Rakshas the Death Dealer. Yeah, he found a card with a specific text box that was problematic for the cards that Jacob had. And that's a hard thing to do against Obs on Control because most of their cards are, are broad-based in nature. Heroes, Downfall, Utter, and it's hard for these cards to not line up the right way against your, the cards your opponents bring to the table unless it's a mana efficiency issue. But Jacob just did not have efficient answers for Rakshasa Death Dealer. Yeah, does have them in his list. They exist. He has, we've seen an Ugin out of the sideboard. Maybe he goes to Ugin now that he just lost a game to a pair of Death Dealers. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those, I, I think, real borderline yeah, cards. I, it's about as powerful as Gurk. I, I think that it's, if Jacob's able to play in a spot where he has a removal spell left over and Jason doesn't have a downfall, that's probably game over. Right. What I like but about mana it is a lot. What, you're right. It's a ton of mana. What I like about it is that if you see that what Jason wants to do in this matchup, as opposed to trying to aggro you out, is he wants to play this protect the death dealer strategy, giving yourself an extra one or two draws that blank that strategy may be worth it. Yeah. It, I mean, it was a specific approach because of the cards Jason happened to draw that game. But he did take a very specific game plan with those death dealers where it was not clear what the objective correct thing to do was, but he had a plan in mind. Uh, the plan that Jason selected is vulnerable to Ugin. He's giving Jacob more turns to, to protect permanents that can just get exiled just as easily as anything else. All right, well, we're underway. Game three, Jacob Wilson versus Jason Coleman. This is our last semifinal. Both players trying to be the one to face Reed Duke in the finals of our Invitational. And we are underway. This time, Jacob is on the play, and Jason will have a thought seize. We see a pair of Seder Wayfinders, a pair of Lands, and a pair of Corsair of Krufix. Now, you would like this hand to have a removal spell just for safety purposes, but this is a nice hand for Jacob. It's pretty thought seize proof. It means that Jacob's going to be able to hit his land drops most likely because he has two coursers, now one courser, and two copies of Seder Wayfinder. And then he's got access to all of his big draws because he's going to be making his land drops the whole way through. Speaking of big draws, Jacob picking up a copy of Elspeth Sun's Champion for the turn. That was one of the cards you said was a key to the game for Jacob. It was she was very absent last game. I'm sure Jacob's happy to see her. It would have it would have blown up that whole game the moment she showed up. Seder Wayfinder going to hit pair of lands gives Jacob the option between a land and a temple. He'll go ahead and take the temple. So we go back over to Coleman. And Jason Coleman, despite having a very good thought seize, this looks like another one of those games where he does not have a turn two creature and he's on the draw, very much in danger of falling behind. Yeah, if he had a second thought seize there to follow up and take the courser, that would have been good. But as it stands, you know, this is the same kind of start we saw in game one where Jason's a little slow out of the gates. And even if he has a pretty powerful follow up, he's going to be behind a little bit. I mean, we're at the point. Right. This is, again, Jacob. Oh, Jacob's on the play. Jacob has a turn three courser of Krufix. Jason Coleman still hasn't made a creature yet. And you start thinking, how is Jason going to get this? Even if he has the kill spell for the Courser, he's not going anywhere. And now we know Jacob also has his late game already sewn up with that copy of Elspeth. Jason will try. Here's Anna Fenza the foremost. Last time we checked, Jacob did not have a kill spell. Maybe this 4-4 can, can swing in for a lot of damage. See Jacob. The draw there. Courser of Krufix coming up next turn. He'll go with another Seder Wayfinder. Doesn't really want the Corsair. See if he can get that free land. Seder will show Siege Rhino, Corsair, two lands. Jacob gets his pick. Uh, Jacob checking to see if he gets to see the top, the next card while he makes his decision. I believe the cards are still technically on top of his deck. Yeah, even though he's obviously moving them off of the deck for the purposes of resolving them, those are still the top four cards until yeah. the Wayfinder resolves. You're, you're just looking at what they are, but they're still in the deck until he picks one. Right. So he doesn't get to see it. Now that he picks the land, though, there's Elspeth on top. For Jason, he knows a threat's coming for Jacob. He knows he has a backup for his first one. So now this is interesting because Jacob really wants to hit his land drops, and Elspeth is not a land drop, and it's another six-man spell, and he already has an Elspeth in hand. But Elspeth is so good that he's willing to keep it, maybe miss some land drops here, because if the first Elspeth gets hit with Hero's Downfall, it's worth it to have the second one, even if it sets him a little bit behind in terms of getting the Elspeth in play in the first place. So Elspeth on top of the deck. Go back over to Jakes and Coleman. One land up, cards in the graveyard. Jacob could have that murderous cut, or maybe Anafenza comes in. Even if Anafenza attacks, Jacob can actually throw all the creatures in front of it. I think his Corsair is more valuable than Jason's Anafenza. I, yeah, I don't Jacob's think... a 21. And also, Jacob really wants to hit land drops. 
So you see, if, Jason, if Jacob keeps the Courser and continues to hit land drops, it's so hard for him to lose. Now, I guess the question is, does he chump away a Courser or a Seder Wayfinder or just take the four? I think a chump blocking is reasonable here. Four is a lot of damage to save. There's, a, a, again, some incentive to, to jump block a little bit earlier here because Jason has Bioblight in his deck. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jacob's in, he, he wants to kill the Anafenza. Yeah, he'll trade it with Course of Crufix. Fine by him. Keeping Jason's board clear. And there's an argument for that. If, if your game plan is to just keep the board even, one of the ways you lose is if Jason establishes, starts attacking for things like, like seven, draws a Bio Blight. This situation certainly decreases the amount of damage you could theoretically take. Yep. Siege Rhino, though, the follow-up for Coleman. Uh, I mean, Jacob obviously values very highly just keeping his life total high given the power level of his hand. The second Courser gives you an incentive to do it as well because, you, you know, you have it on backup here. Yep, he'll play a Temple off the top of the deck. Look at the top card. It's Hero's Downfall. Does he have Land 6, I guess, is the question. He'll keep the Downfall. I think even if he doesn't have Land 6, it's just fine to keep the Downfall on top of your deck because it, it just... Even if you miss a land drop, you have a downfall to answer whatever Jason's play is. Yeah, now, you talked about it before. This is a key turn for Jason. He gets on tap with the Siege Rhino. Now, if he attacks and has land five and has Wingmate Rock raided, that's one of his best ways to answer the Elspeth that's coming from Jacob. Exactly. He does not. He looks like he has thought sees. Game plan was to take the Elspeth. Well, we have a surprise coming for you, Jason Coleman. I said, you better have another thought sees if you want to take <laughs> Elspeth. Two Elspeths and Zader Wayfinder and the sixth land, and it's an untapped one so waiting in Jacob's hand. Jacob getting paid off a big time for keeping that second Elspeth. Jason Coleman, this is this is dangerous. Not what you wanted to see. Uh, you know, the game isn't even clearly going very well for Jason as it stands right now with downfall on top of Jacob's deck, but he did not want to see Elspeth. He'll take the Elspeth. Now, it may be... I believe Jason may have boarded in some copies of Glare of Heresy for this matchup. Yeah, I, he has I, that. He doesn't lose to the Elspeth. Though. Cedrano and Elspeth. There's still this the overall issue of, you know, the game is grinding down. Jacob's draw steps are a little bit more powerful. Even with the Elspeth, it kills Cedrano. It's a two for one. Yep. Or it's three tokens, which takes some time for Jason to get through. I mean, better to have the Glare than to not have the Glare, but... Yeah. yeah, and while this trading's happening, you see Jacob finding another temple on top of his deck. Perhaps he just continues the card advantage. He may even be able to wait a turn. Just play the temple for free. Heroes downfall the fleece main line. Say, yeah, yeah, next turn I'll Elspeth kill your siege rhino. It's fine. Yeah, he's not in a huge rush. I mean, he can, he can take his time here. There's multiple paths. His life toll is still very high. Wants the Elspeth enough this turn that he's willing to play the untapped land. So foregoes the temple on top of his deck. Does mean the Fleece Main Lion will get monstrosity Which is a bit problematic here in the event that uh, Jacob goes ahead and does something about the Siege Rhino here. Yep, four, it will go down to one. She will kill off the Siege Rhino. Go back over to Jason Coleman. Does he have that Glare of Heresy maybe out of the board? That's one of his, that or Hero's Downfall are his ways to get rid of Elspeth. And get that Planeswalker out. It will be exiled. The Siege Rhino Killer. And now he'll make Tassiger. So Jason, he is accepting the challenge of going to the late game. Now we know Jacob has a hero's downfall, so not both these creatures will make it. Now I was about to say, I think there's an argument there for just going monstrous with Fleece Main Line and using the Glare the following turn because a monstrous Fleece Main Line is worth so much. Having a follow-up with Tassiker is so good that it's worth, I think, the Glare plus the Tassiker that turn. Draw from Jacob's a Temple. He sees a Thought Seize on top of his deck. Doesn't really like Thought Seize. He'll go for Seder Wayfinder. Maybe he can get the, another free card here. Bioblight, Thought Seize, Siege Rhino, and Murderous Cut Milled. And, well, didn't find a land with Seder, but did find a land he can play off the top of his deck. It's going to be Windswept Heath. Next card is another Windswept Heath. May not want to draw that one. For Jacob, we know Hero's downfalls in his hand. He may not want to let Jason untap with that Tassiger. Yeah, I think that, that Jacob would be willing to say here, all right, Fleece Main Lion gets to go monstrous, and that's an issue, but I have a lot of chump blockers here and a lot of life to play with. 
but given the way the game looks right now, I think an unchecked Hassaker is very dangerous. Now, how much do you think it changes Jacob's game plan? He only plays two copies of Elspeth Sun's champion. They're both in the graveyard and not really coming back. So normally you'd say, hey, I'm buying time until I hit my late drops like my Elspeths, but if he doesn't have that Garuk or Ugin in the deck, that was his late game. Well, he also has his own Fleece Main Lions potentially. We don't know if they've been boarded in or not. So uh, the Fleece Main Lion is annoying if it goes monstrous, but it is something where Jacob can potentially have some direct answers to it if he brought it to Zugan and may just be able to card advantage it out of the game really mattering that much. Jacob fetched the land before making any decisions. He wanted more information. He sees Obs on Charm on top of his deck, then decides to, mer to, to Hero's Downfall, and it is on the Tassiker. He'll... If Jason wants to spend his turn on it, he'll let him have the 4-4. To be fair, Jason can't actually attack with the 4-4 right now. Jacob swings back for 5. Yep. And is at a higher life total, so... Meanwhile, on Jason's turn, he's going to go ahead and... Almost let Jacob draw the Obs on Charm. Yeah, now he's going to go ahead and Monstrosity the Fleece Man before Jacob draws it. Yeah, well, I think that in case the last card in Jacob's hand was a removal spell, he wants Jacob to use it on his own upkeep rather than on Jason's turn where it's basically free from a mana perspective. Draw from Jacob was Obs on Charm. Mer the Hero's Downfall is the next draw. And at the very least, you could actually use this Obs on Charm just to make a blocker that's big enough to block Fleece Main Line. I think the way the game is shaping up right now, Jason isn't in a position to attack. And so I think Jacob can just sort of wait here. There, there's no rush wait. to do anything. He can draw two. Yep. He can. I suppose he might want to, yeah. Got he a lot even, of options. He can even leave just the Obzon Charm in his hand for a while. Uh, he doesn't have to do anything proactive with it. He doesn't want to. He can save it as a removal spell. Or uh, if the game gets into a real stall out spot, he can just draw cards with it. He's got a lot of different choices. He'll go for the card draw. So Obzon Charm draws a Hero's Downfall, draws a copy of Urborg, and shows Sandstep Citadel on top. So not only did he draw two cards, but he got himself a third card with Corsair. Jacob back up to 20, shows Temple of Silence on top of his deck. Right. And he'll pass. But you're right, yeah, there, this is a board stall here, and that is what Jacob's been trying to set up. Yep, just settling for a pretty long game here. Where he's playing, you know, he's not ahead on the board right now in any clear sense, but it's his draw steps against Jason's. And it's Rakshasa Death Dealer for Jason Coleman. Fleece Main swung in. Jacob went to 16. Now it's these, these problematic two drops. We'll see if Jacob can find another one of his finishers. Still interested to see if he has brought in the Ugin. Ugin in answer to even monstrous Fleece Main Lion. Yeah. I mean, Jason has settled into such a long game himself. You can see post-board, both in terms of the cards he's boarded in and his general play pattern of how to address the matchup. It seems like he's trying to go slower and a little bit longer, and then it becomes attractive, I think, to bring Ugin in if you were on the fence about it before. And a cheeky attack here from Jacob Wilson. He'll swing the 2-4 Corsair Krubix into Rakshasa Death Dealer, knowing that Jason cannot afford to block and regenerate or pump. Yep. He'd lose his Death Dealer if he did. That's one of those attacks where your opponent says, fine, <laughs> two points. And here's going to be attack. Jason going to go aggressive on the way back. Maybe now that he has the Death Dealer, he's willing to try to race. Six power. Will Jacob take the damage? He will. He's down to 11. Sixth land from Coleman. Has one card remaining. We'll see what that follow-up is. Go ahead and crack a fetch on maybe. If it is his own copy of Elspeth, that would really be a play here. I'm surprised Jacob not taking an opportunity here to chump block at least once on the police main line here just because... Uh, Bioblight's a concern, and there could po become a point where Jacob needs to cobble together multiple chump blocks and may not be able to do so. Jacob seems to be pretty con convinced, at least, that Bioblight not still in Coleman's deck. Potentially, yeah. Which is, re is a reasonable assumption. But you're right. I mean, I if it is there and he has one, it's, it's very good. I don't know if these Wayfinders are chumping much more than four points of damage. I guess the counter-argument it is... Uh, Jacob might periodically be able to go on the offensive, depending on what Jason does with, on his turn. He doesn't want to lose the opportunity to do so. Well, the fetch wasn't for Elspeth, but he didn't want to keep up his mana as he makes Siege Rhino here. And maybe if J Jacob once had ideas of racing, he certainly doesn't now. He's down to eight, Jason up to 16. Continuing to play that protect the Death Dealer strategy that served him so well last game. The Rhino will take a downfall. Jacob draws Obs on Charm for the turn, shows Windswept Heath on top of his deck. 
Still, and this is not how I expected this to play out. Both these games, which may have been going Jason's way, have gone long, and Jason's actually overpowering Jacob in the late game. Well, Death Dealer is a big part of it, and, and Fleece Main Lion as well. Uh, Jacob also just hasn't found a lot in the way of power thus far. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it just takes one Sidisi. Yeah. And that's all sorts of problems for Jason. He'll find the 4-6 blocks, the Fleece Main Lion, the card he gets, I assume, is fantastic. At this point, it really comes down to the specifics of how Jacob sideboarded. You know, if he's got a little bit of power left in the deck, particularly the Ugin, even, even Garg's probably good enough. Uh, but we weren't sure whether or not those cards were coming in, and we haven't seen them yet. Can't imagine the Sidisis are gone. They've got to still be in the deck. Yeah. Sandstep Citadel on top after he cracks the fetch land. Jacob wanting to see if he found a reasonable card on top. If so, he could have Obs on Charmed to draw it and maybe cast it that turn. Sandstep Citadel, that's not very appealing. But Jacob's still racing. He's going to swing for four, putting Coleman down to 12. Well, there's not a lot to be gained by blocking right now. And the Obs on Charm covers the Rush Hards of Death Dealer in case Jason tries to get frisky. He's got a Chump Blocker available for the Fleece Main Lion. And he'll make the play. Jacob will take two, go to seven. Jacob hoping for no more threats from Coleman. He plays Sandstep Citadel. One card remaining. Is he going to go for it? Maybe just a land. Certainly if it's something like a Siege Rhino, that is not what Jacob wants to see. And I think Jacob just showing a lot of discipline with that Obs on Charm. Mana doesn't really matter that much. If he needs to cast the Obs on Charm and do something in the same turn, he can do that. And Jacob, lots of cards, but just finding a lot of lands at the moment. You see he's got... Draws the land for the turn, shows another fetch land on top of his deck. Has to decide if he wants to... Debating to playing a temple here with a land on top of the deck, I think it's just... I think you just play the land. It's the same... It's basically the same thing. You get a yeah. scry one if you want it. Top card is Siege Rhino. That's one worth keeping for Jacob. Yeah, and if, if Jacob's on the sort of try to find high impact cards and sort of try to damage race as well, Siege Rhino does both very, very effectively. Yeah, I mean, it, it at the very least, if Jake, Jason has nothing, it just blocks Fleece Main Lion straight up. Exactly, and now he has a, a Wayfinder back to block the Death Dealer if he's feeling so inclined. All right, Jacob swings for three, puts Coleman down to nine. He's now nine to eight. Jason carrying a slight edge. He'll swing in again. This is going to be Fleece Main Line and Rakshasa, Death Dealer. The, lot, the Fleece Main is chump blocked again. Death Dealer getting in for two. Jason knows he can't come pump it because of that Obs on Charm in Jacob's hand. But can Jason find a follow-up threat? Well, he can. It's going to be Fleece Main Line. You count his lands. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He'll cast it and then play the Wingmate Rock post-combat. That is the call. That is exactly what he wanted here. Yeah, I mean, he's still looking at a two-turn clock now with the Siege Rhino being drawn on Jacob's side. Uh, but there it is. I mean, th this could be the thing that finishes off the game. For Jacob, the outs have be become a lot harder for him. Needs to survive through next turn. If he still is playing Ugin and has boarded it in, he needs to find a Sidisi or an Ugin. He has an Obs on Charm in hand to do it, but his life points are very precious. Yeah, we just, we just don't know right now whether that's even an option afforded to Jacob. But if he finds it, all is forgiven here. He should be okay. Yep. Remember, gets a path, Fleece Main Lion, indestructible, hexproof, but still can be exiled. If the Ugin's not in his deck, what do, what do we have for Jacob? End hostilities, maybe? Garrick, if it's in the deck, can still kind of wiggle his way out of this. Uh, you know, there's some cards. Uh, Jason's low, so cobbling together some Siege Rhinos might be able to do it if he can get the initial Wingmate Rock off the table. Uh, but you're looking at some pretty complicated, probably involves multiple cards in a row type of sequences for Jacob to get back in. Now has to figure out whether he wants to keep that Siege Rhino on top. Three life, really valuable here, but looks at cards. He doesn't have many of them. He'll draw a Siege Rhino. Next card up, that's a Temple of Malady. That one will not do. He'll play it. Go up to seven. See the next card. It is Tassiger. Good, but it's not going to save him here. Yeah, not, not any help on the board. And there's a lot of garbage in Jacob's graveyard right now, so... Uh, Get him a, a thought seize, most likely. He'll be able to delve some stuff away, but nothing great. He needs to get whatever one out, whatever outer he has. He either needs to draw it or get Sidisi. 
Here's Siege Rhino, Jacob up to 10, Coleman down to 5. Right, maybe. Well, maybe he can change into Siege Rhino's pen, but there's that life gain ability on Wingmate Rock as well. Exactly. Now Jason has the option of, all right, I'm going to go monsters to my other Fleece Main line. And he's got some very safe attacks if he just wants to gain a little bit of life. Probably better serve leaving stuff back on defense. He'll pass the turn over to Jason. Talked about it before. The key cards for Coleman being that Rakshasa Death Dealer and the Wingmate Rock. Getting Wingmate Rock and being able to monstrosity it pretty huge here. Jacob, he's going to try to race. He's going to exile the, the original Wingmate Rock. Does not want Coleman gaining any life. I mean, he can Tassigar clean out a lot of his graveyard. He has a lot of man to work with. He can clean out enough of his graveyard with Tassigar. Yeah, it's got to be Wayfinders, Thoughtseize. But after that, he's basically looking at a graveyard of removal spells and Elspeth, I think, and hostilities as well. So he can pretty quickly get to something that matters, but he's at 10 and facing down a flyer. Not a lot of time. He's got some time to work with, but not a ton. Jason, he'll take the opportunity. He'll make another cat go monstrous. And he has it. Two, four, four indestructibles. But they're back on blocking. It's just the flyer coming in. Jacob down to seven. And I, I do like the transition from Jacob here. Getting Jason down to five is really hampered Jason's ability to attack once again. Now it's just an issue of how much can he clean out of here that doesn't matter. I mean, there's right now visible three cards in the Thought Seize and the two Wayfinders. So he's the one mana task. Let's see what he gets rid of. Doesn't want to get back Thought Seize. Doesn't want Seder Wayfinders. He can exile two more. Doesn't want to end hostilities. Yeah, you can't take an end hostilities here facing down the two Fleece Main Lions. Yeah, I mean, in, he should be getting rid of... He has one more spell that he can say no to. May want to leave that Bioblade in. Not sure. Bioblade doesn't do a lot here. I mean, there, there's nothing to kill that matters. You can't get rid of the 3-4 token. And that's the one he's going to get rid of. So he's left Obzon Charm, Murderous Cut, Siege Rhino, Hero's Downfall, another Obzon Charm, and an Elspeth, and another Downfall. He'll activate. Lanoir Wastes and Seder Wayfinder in the yard. God, I think Jason will give him that Wayfinder he milled. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the bad case scenario here for Jacob, is he gets a Wayfinder, which is a low-impact card and has the possibility of yielding more low-impact cards. Difficulty here for Jacob. He, he doesn't want to mill too much. If he mills the card he's looking for, he doesn't have a way to get it back. So he's actually, I think, using the Tassiger to just look at extra cards on top of his deck. Maybe not actually wanting to mill the specific card, but wanting to dig to it. Yep. See, milled here. He did mill a Thought Seize as well. So the cards he was exiling away, he may just get. Jason giving him the Thought Seize. But this was the plan. Jacob found his way to a Siege Rhino on top. Some unfortunate Tassiger activations there in that he yielded Jacob two cards that aren't good, but getting closer to that Siege Rhino, you know, that, that he does still have access to that Burnout plan. Yeah, I mean, he's only, if, after this Siege Rhino, he's only one more Rhino away from Lethal. Maybe even swing the team. If he has Obs on Charm to pump, he could even just be in a situation of swing the team, play Rhino, kill you. Yep. Temple from Jason. He'll swing and put Jacob to five, keeping on top with his temple. And the Siege Rhino on top of Jacob's deck, the way that Jason's attacking right now, that's a full turn that he's getting because Jason's only hitting for three right now. A lot of mana. He'll draw Siege Rhino. What is the top card? It's Bile Blight. Getting rid of a block, even a removal spell here, very valuable for Jacob. See if he's looking for the lethal attack this turn. One card in Jason's hand. He may need a removal spell. On the other hand, if he activates that Tassiger again, his graveyard is, well, pretty much removal spells. The problem with an Alpha Strike at this point is that even with the Siege Rhino, Jason can allow the Wayfinder to come through. You have Police Main Line going in front of Siege Rhino, which is a very safe block. You don't have to worry about that getting tripped up by being removed before damage. And then you have other blockers available for the Tassiger, and for the Courser. And even then, it's, it may just be safer if you find a kill spell to just, just kill the Flyer and sit back. Yes. Mill there for two by Jacob. It's a Tassiger activation. Put a new card into the graveyard. It was a Bile Blight. So now, Jason doesn't have any real losers to give back to Jacob here. You see him putting Courser of Crufix to the top. But that's life gain. That's... Even the seemingly innocuous Bile Blight, that is... 
the seemingly innocuous Bile Blight, that's a turn. I mean, the, the worst case scenario for that card is it goes on the token. And Jason, again, is down a turn of attacking at a point where Jacob's about to avalanche him just with card advantage or being able to, to shove the last points of damage across the table. And if you look at the next card here from Jacob, the, as we activate this Tassigur, the next card on top of his deck is Sidisi. Now, if you want to talk about him getting another Siege Rhino and burning Jason out, well, Sidisi, if he has a Rhino left in his deck, is certainly going to be able to find it. Yep. It's hard to think of a world where this Sidisi doesn't find Jacob a winning card. Jacob will play a second Courser. Play Temple, go to seven. Definitely going to keep that guy on top. Makes Siege Rhino. Jason down to two. Jacob up to ten. This may just be it. Yep. And, and Jason, in a not in a position to attack, uh, all the offense is gone. Yeah, these four fives line up very nicely against the four fours. See, Jacob, excellent management here. It takes, it takes a very confident play to just let your opponent get two indestructible fleece main zone line, especially in a matchup like this. Yep. Well, Jacob had the ability to just clog the board. And that's what he's done. He's clogged it up as he makes his way with card advantage and Tassiger toward multiple Siege Rhinos. One Siege Rhino's exiled. That was a Glare of Heresy from Jason. You can see Jacob not even hesitating, shuffling the cards pretty quickly. He knows that that's not going to do it. This Sidisi is going to find a lethal play. Down to seven from the bird token. We're back to Jacob Wilson drawing that copy of Sidisi. And going to... You can tell he's thought seizing. He sees the coast is clear. That's the sense of Citadel. No plays on Jason's side. And Jacob, this should bring him into the finals. Yeah, I mean, he's got five eligible attackers against three blockers. So doesn't even, even need just, the city. Even just on the table, he's good to go. Plays Urborg, goes to seven. But you're right, these four attackers, that should be enough. Or you can go for maximum splash. That's fine, too. <laughs> Sidisi sacking <laughs> Seder Wayfinder. Finds Utter End. Go ahead and kill another blocker. And that'll take care of Rakshas to death. All right, now two blockers. If three didn't work, two certainly won't. And Jacob Wilson, three to one. He's going to move on to the finals. That was a great fourth game there from Jacob, uh, just because from where we were sitting and the way that the game looked on multiple at multiple points, it looked like Jacob was going to have to find some sort of huge trump to get out from the spot that he was in uh, and was able to do it with just kind of the regular nuts and bolts elements of his deck, which did not look like that was going to be capable. But uh, the Tassiker there, being able to chain together multiple Siege Rhinos was enough to beat Jason, even though it looked like Jacob was so far behind that we were talking about cards like Garrick or Ugin being his, his way to get back into it.